Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our orthodontic series. In this video, we're going to talk about early treatment. So phase one or early treatment is rendered during the mixed dentition stage, typically with the expectation of a phase two or second phase of orthodontic treatment later on, which is what the next video will be about. So why do we do phase one treatment? Well, there's really three main reasons. Number one is to improve the overall oral environment. For example, if teeth don't have enough room to erupt properly, or if teeth are occluding traumatically against each other, a second reason could be to correct problems that are easier to fix early on. So while the sutures are more pliable, while growth is still readily happening, and while patients may be more compliant at an early age. Of course, that's not always the case for every patient. And the third reason is to reduce the complexity of treatment in the permanent dentition. So we want to make, if, if we can make later treatment easier and faster, well, that's a pretty good reason to do phase one as well. So we'll spend the rest of this video focusing on problems that can present themselves in the mixed dentition and briefly how we could resolve those problems with a limited phase one treatment plan. So in the transverse, we can have a posterior crossbite, and we now know what that is. And this is typically due to a maxillary transverse deficiency, aka a narrow maxilla. And we talked about what this looks like in our diagnosis and treatment planning video. Speaking of which, I'm going to classify each of these problems into one of those five Ackerman profit categories. This one, of course, is transverse. So we should treat posterior crossbite early if there is a functional shift. That means that when the patient first bites together, some of their teeth touch, but not all of them. And if they keep closing down until all of their teeth are touching, their mandible is going to shift to the left or to the right or even forward or back. And this is a problem because if they're habitually moving their jaw forward or asymmetrically, that can actually stimulate condylar growth and can contribute to a skeletal malocclusion. In these cases, it certainly makes sense to intervene early, maybe age six to nine or so once the permanent first molars are in, but also while the mid-palatal suture is still pliable. We see that with time, the suture becomes more and more interdigitated, and it's harder and harder to peel that apart. So doing this treatment improves the oral environment. It reduces complexity of later treatment if we don't have skeletal asymmetries to worry about, and it's easier to do early on when the mid-palatal suture is less interdigitated. So for these reasons, palatal expansion is a very common and logical phase one treatment plan. And we can do that with a quad helix appliance, which is shown here, and other expanders like the Haas and Hyrax. And we'll talk about all of these appliances in much more detail in the next video on orthodontic appliances. So in the AP dimension, we can have anterior crossbite, which can involve just a few teeth or the entire anterior dentition. If it's one or a few teeth, this can result in uneven wear and or strain on the gingival attachment. This can be treated with limited braces, often called a two by four, where you have two molar brackets in the back on the molars, and then four incisor brackets in the front. And that's just for the arch that you are treating. So in this case, we would treat just the upper arch and work on kicking that uh, upper incisor out in front of the lower incisor. Although we'd probably wanna wait until those permanent laterals are in. Another option is using an active retainer with a finger spring. If we have a full underbite, that's due to a class three skeletal growth pattern, often with maxillary deficiency and or mandibular excess. And this can be treated with reverse pull headgear, 
which is tackling the skeletal discrepancy and trying to pull and stimulate the maxilla to grow forward at its sutures. We'll talk more about reverse pull headgear in the next video. Severe overjet is another anterior posterior problem that can manifest early on in life. And there's a couple of things going on here. There's increased risk of trauma to the upper incisors if they stick out like this, and the child and or parent may be concerned with just the way it looks. And again, we can do a two by four appliance to tip these front teeth back, and or we can use class two headgear, which restrains maxillary growth, again, at the sutures. We'll talk more about these class two headgear types, again, in the next video on appliances. So in the vertical dimension, we can have an early anterior open bite and a dental anterior open bite during childhood is frequently caused by oral habits like thumb sucking, chewing on pens and pencils, and thrusting your tongue forward when you swallow. And the particular malocclusion often coincides pretty directly with the habit and the type of pressure that habit creates. So for thumb sucking, the thumb goes in between the top and the bottom teeth. So it goes kind of something like that. So the cheeks are pulled together during thumb sucking, leading to constriction of the maxilla, which then is in posterior crossbite. You also end up with an open bite, of course, and then proclined maxillary incisors and retroclined mandibular incisors to leave a pocket for the thumb to sit. If we compare that to tongue thrusting, the tongue goes between the top and the bottom teeth. So those, um, this pushes both of those arches of teeth forward, leading to proclined upper incisors and proclined lower incisors, with generalized spacing between all the teeth as they spread out. And of course, you're left with an open bite there too. So how you kick the habit is a combination of patient motivation and help with a habit appliance like a rake or bluegrass appliance in order to interfere with either the thumb or the tongue. We can also get palatal impingement, which is the result of the opposite problem, a deep bite. So palatal impingement, which refers to lower incisors biting into the soft tissue of the palate can cause two potential issues for the child, pain and discomfort and soft tissue trauma or damage to the gingival attachments of these upper teeth. So this can be treated with a maxillary bite plate. It has this thick anterior acrylic that protects the top of the mouth and also helps to intrude those lower anterior teeth and correct the deep impinging bite. Impacted teeth are a really big deal, and it's one of the main reasons orthodontists need to have panoramic x-rays. Upper canines are the most commonly impacted tooth after the third molars. By age 10 or so, you hopefully can start to feel a bulge in the gums where the upper canine crown is developing, and the C's, or the primary canines, should start to be getting mobile at around this age. Another thing to look at is the panoramic radiograph, and you hope that the lateral incisor and the canine are not significantly overlapping each other. So if signs are pointing towards potential impaction, and as long as the canine roots are fairly well developed, it's usually indicated to take out that primary canine to open a path of least resistance for the permanent canine. So one way of predicting the possibility of upper canine impaction is via Kirill's rule, which says if the canine crown has not crossed the midline of the lateral, which is represented by this dashed line, you have a 91% chance of self-correction and eruption after extracting that C. 
but if the canine crown has crossed the midline of the lateral, then you go down to a 64% chance. So that's a really big determining factor at where this canine crown is located relative to the lateral. The rate of impaction also depends on how high up the canine is and how horizontal it is. So the three H's that I like to remember are how high it is, is it horizontal, and has it passed the midline of the lateral. Moderate crowding uh, is not really a huge deal in the mixed dentition because we have leeway space and other natural mechanisms to help us out. But one of the things we generally shouldn't be doing is taking out primary teeth to help with mild or moderate crowding because that actually short circuits arch development. Instead, we can use a lip bumper, which holds the lip out of the way and allows the lower teeth to lean forward. A lower lingual holding arch can also be used once all four incisors are in to hold that leeway space and to prevent incisors from tipping back. So we'll talk more about these two appliances again in the next video. What about for severe crowding though? We're talking about greater than or equal to eight millimeters of crowding. So this is when we were to consider serial extraction. And serial extraction refers to the consecutive removal of primary teeth to facilitate the unimpeded eruption of permanent teeth. And again, it's indicated when we have eight to 10 millimeters of crowding or more. And the patient in these cases often has really big teeth and a really small mouth. And sometimes the laterals are touching the primary first molars. And things just really aren't fitting in the arch. This is contraindicated, however, if the patient has a significant skeletal class two or three, or again, if it's just mild or moderate crowding. So we start this process around the time of permanent lateral incisor eruption. That's when we see that, you know what, things really are not going to fit in here. So the first thing we do is pull the C's, which first allows for proper incisor alignment. So we extract those primary canines as the laterals are coming in, helps them to get into a little bit more favorable position in the arch. Then we pull the D's to encourage four eruption. So we pull the primary first molars in order to create a path of least resistance for the first premolars. As long as those first premolars have had a good amount of root development, it's a good time to pull those Ds in order to accelerate their eruption. If we do this too quickly, the first premolars can actually get delayed in their eruption if a lot of bone is still overlying those crowns. Now, once those fours erupt, we actually want to pull those fours before the threes erupt in order to allow for sufficient space for the threes so that they can erupt in attached gingiva in a healthier position. So that's why it's called serial because we typically follow the order of C, D, and four. All right, so that's it for this video on early treatment or phase one treatment. Thank you so much for watching everyone and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like this video if you did and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for all of their support and you can unlock things like access to my video slides to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.